Today on episode number 790 of CXO Talk, we're discussing business transformation and secrets of the unknown. Our guest is Atif Rafiq. He's the former president of MGM Resorts International, and he's had an extraordinary career. I really came up through digital native tech companies, and <clears throat> I've been part of startups as well as tech giants, and I rose to a GM level at Amazon. I, I ran a fairly sizable business unit. In 2013, many industries began to see that technology would reshape how those industries work. And there began to be more technology-focused roles in more traditional companies outside tech. And I then went on a 10-year run, starting as a chief digital officer for McDonald's. And over that 10-year period, I rose to the president level, in this case, at a large global company called MGM Resorts. Um, so I've kind of been in the pure Silicon Valley culture and also in the traditional culture of other large businesses. Atif, you wrote this book. It's called Decision Sprint. Tell us about that. The soundbite is a lot of people are calling Decision Sprint atomic habits for innovation. And the reason why uh, they say that is because it is very focused on innovation. But what's different about it is uh, looking at innovation and looking at the specific building blocks of how innovation works, what the pitfalls are and how to avoid them so that you can get a higher hit rate on your innovation, so more quality, but also move faster with more velocity, which is something I think every every company in any industry is looking for. Uh, a little, uh, to be a little bit more specific, the book helps you um, make the leap from ideas to action by confronting the unknowns. And I've really chosen to focus on what I believe is the hardest part of turning ideas into action, which is embracing the unknowns. So in the book, I introduced the notion of upstream work, which is where promising ideas face more questions than answers. That's in const uh, contrast to downstream, which is the execution part of an initiative. So there's an upstream part that I feel hasn't really been um, elaborated on in, in enough detail. And so I focused on that. I walked through the hidden structure of upstream work and introduce the methods that any team can use to apply it to a specific thing that they're working on. When you talk about upstream work, can you be uh, a little bit more specific so that we have a clear picture of what that actually is? The first thing you realize after having a bright idea is that there are more questions than answers. And what uh, one typical response to that is um, essentially, trying to build a plan and moving on to start to build something uh, based on the things that are known inside the company. What do we know about this problem we're trying to solve? But um, what typically happens is that along the way, you realize there are blind spots, there are unknowns, they come up and they're very disruptive to the, you know, to moving the idea forward because these blind spots make us uh, have to basically go back to the start and uh, start again from scratch. And so, when I talk about upstream work, I'm talking about uh, the process of actually servicing all the important unknowns and knowns at the beginning and getting to the bottom of them in some structured way. So making the unknowns actionable. So it could be as simple as developing a great question list of uh, organized by subject matter and giving a team space a week or two to run an exploration, which is essentially um, a discovery process around the key questions and developing something like an FAQ. This is a very common practice at Amazon, for example, in every single initiative that they work on. And on the basis of that high quality detective work, that's when they move on to alignment. So they don't move on to, they suspend judgment on what's the right course of action or strategic direction. They spend time on exploration and discovery. They do a really great job of it. And then they move on to alignment then when people start nodding their heads because they're standing on high quality understanding of the problem, they're ready to move on to execution. And so there is a, a little bit of a sequence and a structure to how you go from the ambiguity of a, a great idea, however great it is, to being able to get a company to commit resources and uh, be confident enough to move on to execution. How is this different from traditional approaches. I think anybody who's running a project of any type will look across the landscape and come up with 
some type of list of what we don't know, what or what the uncertainties are, or the risks. How is this different from that? I think it's really two main differences. Um, the first is making innovation more purposeful, and the second is making it more inclusive, but without being slow. So let me walk through each one. Um, a lot of times when we have a bright idea, we rush ahead to developing a plan to you know, realize it and start building it. But instead, we might start with a problem statement and really getting a lot of clarity around the problem that we're, we're trying to solve. Like if you take an example in the world today, let's say you're Netflix and you have a problem with password sharing, right? If you define the problem in, in one way versus another, you're gonna get very different recommendations that the team puts on the table. If I say the problem for Netflix is to, you know, kind of crack down on password sharing, that's very different than saying the problem is trying to find a balance between the needs of the user and the commercial needs of Netflix and trying to find the fair fairness within that space. If we start out with the right problem statement, the team is going to produce very different work along the way. So when we, I, I think when we look at innovation, it's not just having a bright idea and moving on to start building a prototype. We need to, for example, uh, make it more purposeful by anchoring it in the right problem statement and then running our exploration against that problem statement. Now, that leads me to my second point around more inclusive, because it's my belief that the kinds of problems we're solving in business today are complex, meaning you cannot solve them in one corner of a company. And so when I talk about being inclusive, I mean really getting enough of the right brains of the company around the problem we're trying to solve. This doesn't happen enough in business because we think innovation is the job of one corner of the company. But when we do that, what happens is that, you know, the idea moves forward a bit, but then it runs into roadblocks because of some miss, missed items or some blind spots. And then the project experiences some fits and starts because people are not confident because they can poke holes. So I'm providing a workflow and a methodology where you could be purposeful and more inclusive, but not slow and bureaucratic. And I think that's the sweet spot of innovation that we need in this era. Give us some examples of how this works in practice, because I think the goal that you have, the or the goals, I should say, that you've set out, which is to be very clear, to be thoughtful and inclusive around where you're headed. Again, everybody would kind of take that as, as motherhood and apple pie. And so what is different and how do you address this challenge? Because it is such a profound challenge for many organizations. Well, let's say uh, you form the team around a strategic initiative. You're at the start. You don't have to be at the start, but let's say you are. Uh, what happens in companies? Well, teams spend weeks and months, and they go through a process of putting recommendations on the table, um, socializing those recommendations. And if those things look good, then they get move on to decision making where the company commits to you know, the necessary actions. Now, this entire process takes weeks and months. What I'm suggesting is that we break it into three main stages. The first is exploration. And exploration is a concerted effort to surface the right considerations, especially the unknowns, and get to the bottom of them. Now, when you do exploration, um, it's a very neutral process. So you're not leaning one way or the other. You know, it, this idea is too crazy. It's too small. Uh, it's the right direction. It's not the right direction. It's a more neutral exercise around uh, surfacing um, the important considerations, especially the unknowns, but also the knowns and developing enough of a high quality ground uh, to, to then move on to the next phase, which is alignment. And alignment is about bringing together what's been explored to draw conclusions. Now, this is an important point because in my book, I write about uh, a mistake I made where I banned the word alignment in companies uh, and being in the C-suite managing thousands of people, you know, that was a big decision. The reason I banned it is because I was reacting to the tendency in companies to align before they explore. And that led to very small thinking because if you if you don't explore, um, then you don't know if something is really risky or hard to pull off. It may be very achievable, but if you rush ahead to align on the known commodities, you generally do, 
uh, align on very small thinking and produce small outcomes, which I didn't want. And I write about in the book how I, uh, you know, I, I reframe my thinking and it wasn't about banning alignment. That wasn't the right move. It's about reframing alignment so that you do exploration before alignment. And so I started to preach the mantra of explore, then align. And so teams got that. I gave them the space to do their exploration. But the second phase of alignment is about drawing conclusions. But you need to do that based on a, a really good process of exploration and discovery. When, when you do that, you tend to get um, very easy alignment in companies because people tend to nod their heads because they they can't poke holes. The blind spots are covered. You know They can see how you got to the recommendations. They can draw the red thread between what you're recommending and how you got there, which is very essential, but not as common as you would like in companies. Once you have alignment, your third phase is decision-making, which is identifying the necessary actions. And those are usually very layered that you need to begin executing. So if you bring this together into a flow, it, it becomes very, very powerful. Today is very unstructured. It sounds like you're fundamentally driving a culture change based on a shifting mindset, shifting away from structure first and decisions first in order to reduce the ambiguity. Instead, you're saying, let's have an open field at first and let's narrow down from there based on our initial goals. Is that a correct way of looking at this? Yeah, in fact, I refer to it as input obsession. Like you want to be obsessed to get inputs, especially upfront in the up upstream stage, because um, that's really going to save a lot of uh, pain down the road. And when I talk about input, I mean things like, what do we know? What do we not know? What could go wrong? What do we need to get right? And you should be hungry for those inputs at the start because they're not... Um, like casting judgment on your idea. They're just trying to help you develop and mature that idea and make it super strong. And in a company, it's not one corner of a company that has enough of these inputs. And this is a big problem today because, you know, if you look back at the last 25 years of, of innovation, you know, you have different models where you say, okay, let's have an autonomous team that's doing innovation. Nothing wrong with that to start. But eventually, you need to get input from the, the center of a company or the core of a company in order to see, hey, how can you contribute to our exploration? What should we be thinking about? I'm trying to find the sweet spot where the core of the company is not going to crush the idea because that happens a lot and, and that's not good. But also, we're not doing autonomous, isolated innovation that eventually fails to, to scale because it missed a whole tranche of considerations that it didn't build into how it thought through the idea, if that makes sense. So there is a sweet spot to leverage the connect collective intelligence of the organization, but do that upfront so that as you're developing and maturing the idea, putting the recommendations on the table, uh, it just feels like it really holds together. And that's where people start to nod their heads, provide their support, and the idea gets momentum. And so that's what I'm trying to uh, propose. And I think if you look back, we've the pendulum that always swings in companies between the autonomous innovation and sort of doing innovation in the core. And I think neither is exactly right. So I'm trying to offer an alternative. The problem that you've just described is so endemic. You know, we hear the term in, uh, anti innovation uh, antibodies in some cases, that when a business wants to go down a new or a changing or a different path, you have the entire weight of existing processes and compensation plans and incentives and all many, many, many different kinds of reasons to keep going with what we're doing, especially if we're successful. And what you're describing seems like a seems like a, like a, a really big, almost unobtainable kind of goal for many large organizations. It is hacking the system, that's for sure. And I have a, 
a chapter on how to hack uh, a company's culture. And I have a chapter on personas related to innovation. And the reason I put in the personas, Michael, is because in my view, um, you can take advantage of the skeptics in an organization and actually you can flip the script. And the way to do that is to take their input actually. So not to ignore them, but to take their input and take it as neutral input in the form of a question. If someone get, if I have a bright idea, I'm at the, I'm at the start and I have a question, I can do something about it. I can make that question actionable. I can get to the bottom of it. I can say, we looked at it and it's not as big a barrier as we thought, or thank you so much. That actually made our idea stronger. However, if that question comes up downstream, when we have the, when we have the big meeting with the recommendation and the ask, then that question turns into questioning the idea itself is very different. So the reason I'm obsessed with this idea of upstream work is that if you get that input upfront, make it actionable, you can do something about it. You can hack the organization, even skeptics actually. So um, I do look at all roles in the company as being contributors to innovation. People who are you know, let, more skeptical about ideas, fine, let's neutralize their input and take it as a, let's build it into our question list. People who are visionary and who get it and who are living in the future, great. Let, let them take advantage of that input to make their ideas stronger and more sound. Don't forget, please subscribe to our newsletter. Hit the subscribe button on our website and you can subscribe to our YouTube channel. Check out CXOTalk.com. We have amazing shows coming up. Can you give us an example of where you took a situation in, in any one of your various uh, really interesting positions that you've had and, and applied these principles? There are many examples in the book. Um, just to, I'll share two real quick. I mean, at Amazon, uh, which is, you know, very forward looking and open to new ideas and pushing new territory. So culturally it's aligned, but it, it does face hard problems where it doesn't always know the answer. So uh, when I was running a part of the Kindle business where we allow authors to independently publish their books without a publisher, for example, um, we wanted to introduce uh, an exclusivity program where they, we would incentivize them to only publish with Amazon, which would really help help the company quite a bit and we would give them more royalty. So it sound, it sounded like a, a good idea that we could probably pull off, but the challenge is it's Amazon, it's a behemoth. And so you don't want to do things where you're already strengthening your already strong position in the marketplace. You have to be very careful and sensitive. So when it comes to things like uh, making sure people honor their commitments in this exclusivity program and compliance and monitoring and governance and all that stuff. It wasn't easy stuff, uh, things in terms of how you enforce the policies. We definitely had a lot of ambiguity around that. So looking at the stance we should take when someone you know violates a policy, like should we be uh, directly enforcing it? How strong should we be? We use uh, the idea of surfacing you know, the things that could go wrong and developing the right questions to uh, to come to the right sort of sweet spot of finding that balance between enforcement and not trying to be, you know, an overbearing giant of sorts. So that's one example. Uh, at Volvo Cars, um, something where, you know, I wasn't necessarily um, directing, but I think it's very relevant. You know, Volvo's big on the idea of sustainability. And so you know, a bright person in the company had an idea, which was about the interiors of the cars. And the, the idea was vegan leather. So, you know, if cows have a lot of emissions, how about producing a leather that's, you know, from sustainable resources? There's a, there's a bright idea. I think it's part of the sustainability positioning of the company. But is it something that the company should, should act on? There's a lot of questions, you know, is it feasible to get enough materials for for vegan leather um you know what kind of customers would would, would customers pay more for it uh for example could you even trace back the uh materials and verify that they're actually you know uh from sustainable sources could we get enough volume for the amount of cars we're going to produce you know a lot of 
questions before you know, hey, this is a, a good idea or, uh, or or not. And so embracing those questions at the start and making those questions something you get to the bottom of so before you draw conclusions or have a strong opinion, that is something that was helpful to the company in that case. We have a, a really interesting question from Twitter from Arsalan Khan. Arsalan is a regular listener, and he always asks these very thought-provoking questions. And he says this. So I'm going to ask his question and then broaden it slightly. Okay, He says, digital transformation is an enterprise-wide effort. Not everyone is interested in doing it. And now here is his question. He says, how do you create a pipeline of innovation that is not only done by the R&D department, and then I want to broaden it to the larger issue of, you spoke about alignment earlier, and inside any large organization, you have so many conflicts of interests and different goals and silos, and as I said before, compensation incentive plans that produce certain outcomes that are entirely at odds with this, this unified approach that you're describing. And so building on Arsalan's question, how do, we, how do we bring the pieces together? Every company needs a North Star and some strategic pillars. And I find companies are generally pretty good at that. So to use an example, when I arrived at McDonald's, and, and we can talk about my transition from Amazon to McDonald's, but the um, you know the the idea was okay, digital transformation, but people didn't know what that was, so I didn't really use that term. I talked about convenience because in my mind, uh, McDonald's for over sixty years has been about three things: taste, value, and convenience. And I got a lot of nodding heads when I when I spoke um, in that in that way. And then I talked about reimagining convenience and new ways to use McDonald's because there were a couple ways to get your food from McDonald's. And how about we in, invent a couple more? You know, we've been so successful if we invented a couple more compelling, easy, convenient ways to use McDonald's. You know, could we grow the company? And 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 people understood that line of thinking. So. The first point I think is a company needs a North Star, it needs some strategic pillars, it needs to be in familiar language. So it's not about uh, lingo, it's more about uh, the heritage of the company, but reimagining it in the modern sense, if that makes sense. And so uh, I double down on convenience, and then I could talk in detail about uh, more uh, lingo, like we need two new service models, these service models need to be technology enabled. They will be digital experiences for the customer. Um, and in order and in the process of providing this, you know, next level convenience through digital experiences, we're going to become a direct to consumer company. We're going to have um, a lot of profiles and data and be able to be personalized with each customer. And, and that's sort of a business model shift as well. So the digital experience. For the customer, uh, for the customers, shifting to a different way of looking at the business. So now you have a cohesive sort of strategic frame. Now that's that part is um, within my arrival at McDonald's. That took me about forty-five days to put to get that together. The rest of the years were about making it real, and so that's where we come to um, the actual transformations that uh, you know that are part of this question, which which is essentially that. Um, you know, any given idea, okay, a curbside pickup at McDonald's, you just drive into a parking spot, your food is brought out to you. Or let's say table service, which is basically you order at a kiosk, take a seat, and the, we bring the tray to you. Two new ways to use McDonald's didn't exist before. There's a lot of hairy things that need to be thought through. So it's not uh, easy to know exactly what the execution plan would be. That's where this idea of upstream work creates the space for teams to, it's okay for them not to know the answers to questions in the beginning, as long as they know the right questions they should be exploring. And then if they drive that through a, a method of, uh, of um, you know, exploration discovery where we can have them draw the right conclusions and be convinced about the things they're recommending, that's the way to make the glue um, 
And um, of course, when it comes to uh, corners of the company, some folks are more on the day to day, but they also need to contribute because they have good input. So I would recommend saying, hey, you know, percentage of your time goes to helping us innovate because innovation is you know, kind of, uh, in some respect, everyone can contribute to it. We hear people talk about clarity of goals, and you sp- you will spoke about that earlier. Would it be accurate to say, based on your comments, that simplicity of goal is also crucially important here? I think 100%. I mean, it needs to be conversational. So if I walk in an elevator with a normal person who's not in the company, I can explain where our organization is headed. Um, and that could be, you know, like I said, convenience in the case of McDonald's. It could be in the case of Volvo that, you know, a car, all the tech in the car from the safety systems to the um, infotainment to the cloud controlling my car through my app. You know, it's it needs to be easy, easy to use and simplify your life. Um, you know, you need to be able to explain that the high level direction with simplicity. But I have one point to make around goals which is that companies are pretty good at setting goals and objectives. And you have ideas like OKRs, but those are incomplete because if you look at an OKR, you have the O, which is the objective, and then the result, which is all the way down here. But in the middle, it's a lot of hard hard work. And so teams spend weeks and months figuring out how do you convert this objective into a concrete initiative and what's the nature of that initiative and all the contours of that initiative and what what are we actually going to execute in order to achieve that result and that's that's where i focus and i guess my overall point is that um that is where we need not just the clarity of the goal but we need the clarity of thinking and the clarity of thought how do we actually develop this idea, um, you know, across, uh, you know, in all, in er- every different contour of this idea. That's, that's the hard part in my view. But when we talk about the goals and simple goals and conversational goals, and that's just great advice for anybody and really, really hard to do to, to distill down and come up with the concept, the right concept, the simple concept, and then the right words the simple conversational words around that. But in a large company, even getting folks to agree on the goal is sometimes an almost impossible feat to accomplish. And so in your experience, you've had the, these very uh, diverse set of senior management positions. How did you do that? How did you, how did you herd these cats? It's my view that people, we have a very hard time getting people to agree on the solution, uh, generally, like they they agree with the uh, North Star. I mean, let's say you're MGM Resorts and you do a great job of catering to people who gamble, but then you realize, well, there are a lot of people who open up the wallet and they don't gamble. They go and attend <clears throat> shows. They spend a lot on very nice restaurants. Um, they buy suites and hotels. There's a lot of big ticket spending going on, but those people don't gamble and we don't do a great job. I'm just rolling back a couple of years ago. The company has progressed a lot, but um, <clears throat> we weren't doing a great job of, of, of being customer oriented, treating them, you know, better recognizing them being, you know, generating loyalty and rewards for them, for example. So generally I think people agree that, Oh, that's the gap. That's where the growth's going to be. The objective is to really, um, you know, grow that part of the business. Okay, fine. And the solution is where people, um, you know, well, this won't work or that's too hard or this is the right solution, et cetera, et cetera. That I think is um, very hard in companies. So the way to herd the cats is, I think, to sus- and really what I'm pushing is the idea of suspending judgment, um, you know, creating a space, an actual space and an actual workflow to do something like exploration. So in my case, if if a team came to me and said, we have the big idea, we don't know what the solution or the recommendation is yet, uh, we don't have the plan to execute yet, but we're going to spend one or two weeks and we're going to build an exploration. We're going to get input from the right, you know, brains in the company. We're going to make a list of 
all the right questions. And we're going to start with these questions. And at the end of this week or two, we're going to deliver to you an FAQ. And, and that's really going to help us begin to kind of converge our thinking on, hmm, what actually makes sense in terms of that, the solution we need to go after. I would say that's a really good use of time and I would support them. And that's why I'm advising, you know, generally speaking, is that we create a space uh, for to build and run explorations to feed the alignment that is necessary in companies in order for something to actually happen. To be explicit at the outset that there are things we don't know and stop the posturing and the assumptions that we are the masters of the universe who know everything to be explicit about that and build that build that time and capability in essentially is what you're saying. A hundred percent. I think we're all a part of the problem is my overall point because you uh, we like to blame the person who says, oh, I've been here 30 years and I know that won't work. And we know that's not the right answer either. But as a, as a very innovative person or the person brought in to in it, help a company innovate, I've been part of the problem too, because I said, well, no, I've said the opposite. I said, no, that's a wonderful idea. Let's let's start concepting and prototyping and let's get 10 people on this right now and, and start to test it and experiment and let's just get going. And sometimes that's not also the right answer because uh, you, you you need to uh, be explicit around, um, you know, more purposeful around what you're experimenting around. It's not just about getting started with the prototyping and the experimentation. It's about what do we need to learn uh, and, and making the experiments uh, based on the, the gaps and the unknowns that would help us, um, you know, be much smarter about things. So I think whether you're, you lean towards innovation or you lean towards like business as usual, you know, we need, uh, we, we need a way that's uh, kind of m m mitigating some of the, the you know, the, the downside of both approaches. Arsalan Khan comes back with another great question, and uh, I'm, Arsalan listens a lot, and, and I'm afraid that our two minds are sort of becoming very similar, because I love this. The, the questions he asks sometimes, it's like, oh yeah, I should be asking that. Okay. So he says this. It's a great question. He says, why should a frontline employee be involved in innovation? After all, they don't get incentivized nor are they paid enough to do this. Executives might care about innovation because ultimately that's going to be connected to their performance and their compensation. But why should frontline employees care about this at all? It's like, you know, just I'm serving hamburgers or whatever it is that I'm doing, just leave me alone so I can do my job. Usually we have interfaces to the frontline workers. So it's not like you put a frontline worker in your, you know, your innovation squad or your strategic initiative team or anything like that. But I mean, you typically have, um, you know, some uh, field level managerial people who are listening and have a pulse of, you know, what the frontline, uh, you know, worker is seeing with customers. And so that's what I'm assuming. So really, um, my book and my ideas and my background, quite frankly, is really more for knowledge workers, you know, in different quarters of the company, and they could be incorporated, they could be in the field. But they're generally uh, knowledge workers who are, um, yeah, tr trying to figure out, um, yeah, what makes sense for the business and and for customers. So I'm not suggesting that uh, you know the frontline worker be part of sort of the, <laughs> the innovation squad here presenting to the CEO. But of course, they have. You will see some patterns in what they're what they're sharing, um, and I think those things are obviously need to feed feed into things. But, you know, uh, it's a, I like the question because I think too often, if, if you had a project in a company, uh, what happens? Well, it's the same three or four people that you're meeting with every week or every month about the idea. And then you think, well, this organization has 40,000 people or 10,000 people or 2,000 people. There's got to be more input than just these three or four people. I think that's important in companies is finding a way to say, okay, what are we not seeing that someone in this company might uh, might be seeing? There has to be a way to do that. And the, I think a way to encourage getting that input is is curiosity, is an obsession for input. 
and and if you set that as an expectation, then there are probably ways to to kind of get to to get your hands on it. It strikes me, and maybe this is an obvious point, but it strikes me that to do what you're describing requires the senior leaders to actually have an interest in change in this kind of exploration. It helps a lot, but it's not required because, and here's why it's not required, because typically the interaction with senior executives is on some cadence, you know, a bi-weekly check-in or hey, we gave you the assignment for the big idea, come back in a month and tell us how we should be thinking about this, you know, what you're recommending. So the uh, senior executives, you know, probably are not involved in the the brainstorms, the deep dives, you know, the work, the team level work. So what I'm suggesting, and, and I write about this in the book, is that, um, you know, teams, as opposed to having unstructured deep dives and brainstorms and and then, you know, it's three days before the meeting and we're not really clear, like what we're going to put on the table, you know, bring uh, some approach to it, like like decision sprint. Now, in the end, what the executives will see is the content, which is essentially, hmm, I'm able to follow where you started, what you investigated, the conclusions you drew, the recommendations you're putting on the table. Based on those recommendations, here's the commitments and actions the company needs to to take on. And whether that's great or not great, I think they'd be able to follow it. And so the way you drive change from a team level up, bottom up, is by just producing that better, having that better interaction, that better content. Then what happens is the executive say, hmm, this is so much more streamlined than my last meeting. What did this team do different? And they'll say, you know, we have a, a different methodology. Like we actually have uh, uh, brought some method to the chaos. And and executives will be like, wait, we should apply that to other things we're working on. So that's a way to help drive change in a company. I believe that change can absolutely be bottom up. The senior leadership is really interested in seeing results. And if you can demonstrate any kind of result, interim results included, then a smart senior leader is going to take that ball and carry it or suggest that you take that ball and and run with it further. If we define result as basically your work product is easier to follow and allows for confident decision making, it, it, that you're making the life of an executive so much easier because the the job is very hard. The decisions are very hard to make. You cannot predict the future, but if you can help the organization stand on much higher quality ground of information or confident decision-making, you've really, really helped your company. And a good executive will say, how, how are you approaching that? And how can we scale that across more uh, of the organization? And then also, it shifts the role of the executive. The executives tend to then give space and release a control orientation and then move to what I call calibration over control. And what I mean by that is they help become a thought partner in your work. They don't tell you what to do and they don't, um, they, they're much better listeners and they help calibrate your thinking to improve it, but they don't, um, they don't uh, go back and regress to the tendency of saying, this is what I want the answer to be, because that's always going to be very risky. Even if someone is senior in a company, for one person to be saying this is the right answer is very dangerous. That's why we have teams. Atif, we're almost out of time. Can you share advice for, I'm thinking, maybe specifically for a few different roles, uh, starting with the CIO. You you were a chief information officer, so you have so you understand that role certainly. Can you can you share your advice given all of this for CIOs? As a CIO, amongst one of my roles, I always tr- shifted the conversation to be, um, you know, uh, not just having the IT organization. I rebranded IT as enterprise digital. It's not just be an order taker be like a true bona fide partner in uh, thinking things through. Um, but for any role in an organization, I think the in the what good looks like to me is basically the engine behind the work. And 
embracing the idea of exploration before alignment, you know, getting people to postpone judgment, not rush ahead to saying this is the answer, this is the solution, and to really invite people to um, to, to really um, do the upfront discovery around what could go wrong, what are the right questions, how do we give teams space just a week or two to um, get to the bottom of these questions, and then use something like even FAQs to help drive you know some common understanding of the strategic direction. So whether it's a CIO or any other role, I think that's really what you know being a senior leader is all about: is being able to kind of <clears throat> direct the collective intelligence of the team, form the right uh, uh, kind of uh, brain trust, and give them the space to do these things and then help calibrate their ideas. Cause you, you probably see more information in your higher level role, uh, if that makes sense. So it's more the workflow. I like to think of the next big role in the company. And in fact, the role of the CEO, I think in the future is the chief workflow officer. Um, and because if you can get the workflow right uh, around how people progress ideas into plans and actions, then you know you are really really helping the company then why don't we finish up with advice to ceos on managing being aware of encouraging this upstream work the ceo basically you have the north star you have the strategic pillars you're you're putting this in front of wall street it's in all your board decks you know we get it but we all know that you know, inside the four walls of the company you know uh, these initiatives are very hard, they're very complex, and it's not obvious what needs to be done. And so if we want momentum, um, you know, the idea of of building a, a sequence, like if, if, if you have a big initiative, meet with your team in three steps. You know, the first meeting is the messiness, like you mentioned Scott's book, okay, share with me all the messiness. I don't need any <laughs> any answers. We're not deciding anything. That's going to come later, but show me you did a good job of canvassing the messiness. That's progress in and of itself. Your second meeting, you got to the bottom of the messiness. Did you make sense of it? Give me one or two or three or four conclusions you're drawing from having uh, gone deep into this messiness um, on the deep end. And then number three, like now, what is the solution? What is the direction? Because if you do it, if you um, orchestrate it in that way, you have fewer blind spots, fewer surprises. You've done the best job you can. Because as executives, we are responsible to be on top of the knowns and the known unknowns. If there's anything else, you know, we don't predict the future. But those first two, we've got to get them right. We have to be on top of them and we have to be able to connect them to the actions the company is going to proceed with. So I think these three steps could be a good uh, use of time for everybody. Great. Well, thank you for the insightful advice. And with that, we're out of time. So I want to say a huge thank you to Atif Rafiq. Thank you for being with us today. I really appreciate it. It's been a pleasure being with you, Michael. Thank you so much. And huge thanks to everybody who watched. You guys are a great audience. And don't forget, please subscribe to our newsletter, hit the subscribe button on our website, and you can subscribe to our YouTube channel. Check out CXOTalk.com. We have amazing shows coming up during the summer. Our newsletter will notify you of all of them. Thanks so much, everybody. I hope you have a great day, and we'll see you again next time, next week.